Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to first introduce the Provost Lecture Series. And so this is uh, one of the first initiatives the Provost Office has undertaken since I took the office uh, exact one month ago. And since July, I have talked to many faculty members, um, about 70 and counting. And uh, so, so based on many conversations, and uh, I realized that it's very important to create this, uh, the, the Provost Lecture Series. And the purpose is to celebrate milestones in the careers of many OIS faculty members. In particular, we want to acknowledge their research success, honor their service to the university, and uh, also, so we would love to hear their thoughts and uh, learn from their experience when they share their teaching and mentorship of students. So in discussion with Peter, um, in, uh, which is very complementary to uh, the President Lecture Series, so we invite external speakers. The Provost Lecture Series will be mainly catered towards uh, internal OIS faculty members. And this also uh, matches very well with the ongoing faculty lunch talks, which is more casual and shorter. Um, so we, we also try to avoid the scheduling conflict with uh, those two lecture theories. And to, um, so before I start, I would like to really thank um, the people shown on this slide who made the Provost Lecture Series happen. Uh, so in particular, I would like to thank Matsukawa-san from uh, the Office of the Provost. Uh, so she worked very hard and uh, to push the process through because we're on a deadline. I don't know if you know, Ichiro is leaving in eight days. And so we're very happy and also with the lift of the COVID prevention starting today. So we're able to book the room and make the first lecture on November 1st. Um, so in addition, also Magai Sam from the Office of the Provost helped us a lot working behind the scene to to figure out the budget and logistics. Um, so in addition, I would like to really also um, pay my uh, special thanks to Kaori san and she has been amazing in terms of designing the posters, and many of you already know her because she designed almost all the fabulous post uh, uh, posters um, over different events, and also Red, uh, who has been really helpful and who is going to write a TIDA story and uh, to promote this series. And so this is an example. So Kaori san designed uh, the, the poster series and also worked very closely with uh, Matsukawa san. And uh, Matsukawa san found this uh, picture frame from the house close to Naha, uh, close to her house. And we also try to use, take advantage of the OIS facility. So Patrick Kennedy, who is the section leader in the engineering section, um, so we designed together, uh, was uh, using the 3D printer to make the acrylic insert and to make this uh, picture frame work. And this Ichiro will be presented to you after your lecture. So finally, I also want to thank uh, everyone shown um, on this slide from Peter to, to Kato-san and many, many others. And they have been very supportive. And we need uh, all the signatures you can imagine to make the Provost Lecture Series official. And uh, so the take home message is it takes a village. And uh, so we, we need to uh, work together closely with uh, the administrators and uh, so they are uh, so actually, they're uh, quite busy helping us uh, to promote our research and to make the operation uh, smooth and uh, possible. So finally, so I want to introduce Ulf, Professor Of Scotland, who is going to be the chair of this lecture series. And Of is a professor at OIS. He's also the graduate, the dean for graduate school. And finally, before I forget, um, so after the lecture series, uh, so we, we will serve some coffee, tea, and snacks in the patio area. But please be mindful so we can prevent the COVID-19. I do not want this becoming 
the big you know spread event. So without further ado, Ulf. Yeah, so hello everybody and welcome. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our main speaker here, Ichiro. And uh, you all have seen him forever here. And I've also seen him forever. The question we all put ourselves is, of course, who is Ichiro, right? And uh, is a person, he likes the minimalistic truth that characterizes a phenomenon. And I think this is very peculiar, because when you talk to Ichiro for a while, he doesn't like to bloom over in things that are completely unnecessary. So he's very condensing. It's very interesting. So if you haven't spoken to him about phenomena that he knows a lot about, you missed out. And he's not a quitter. So he keeps investigating until he is satisfied. So he's very stubborn, right? And of course, this is usually for us researchers that that's true, actually. And so wonder, because he's such an investigative character, no wonder he likes golf. And although Ichiro has always had a burning desire to understand signaling, and signaling is you know, within the cell cultures in, in the, the bodies, is how uh, some kind of signal goes from one place to another to trigger something. And this is an exceedingly difficult phenomena to characterize correctly. And so whenever there is a model out there, the first thing you can think of is, oh my god, it's another model. And, and then how many years will it take before they have uh, removed that model or refined the model? And he has worked really hard on this over many years and has a very, very interesting result right now. So what are we talking about in his case? Well, he's very interested in, in uh, one of these special molecules that changes shape, the epidermal growth factor receptor. And uh, it, it has an domain structure which is in the cell and a domain structure which is outside. And upon binding something, there happens something in here. And you get uh, an action point. And you can see this a little bit like molecular dances. And you wonder what drives all these molecular dynamics. Well, it's actually water and the temperature. And because you can have mainly actually this structure or anything in between there. Water molecules, as I say, they are the main supplier of energy to transform the molecules into one structure or another. And of course, we can always put together, like I did here, so that you see a dance. But the funny thing in molecular dynamics is you can go from the left picture to the right picture in just one go. Uh, so this is the sort of continuous movement that you would like to see, but it doesn't necessarily be the way it happens inside the cells. He has been working very hard on this. So he has a very long history in biological science field, as you will hear from him. Uh, I'm not going to talk about his field exactly. He will do that. Uh, he's an excellent scientist. He's an excellent teacher. He's an excellent supervisor. He's an excellent colleague and collaborator. And uh, he has a v been very, very helpful to OIST in many different committee works. The simple truth is that Ichiro is just Ichiro. And you have to know this fellow a bit, right? He joined five years before I came here in 2005. And it's for sure that retirement is not going to stop his brain. And uh, with that, I will welcome Ichiro up and talk about his wonderful stuff. OK. First of all, thank you, uh, Ulf, for a wonderful introduction. Maybe too kind, I guess. <laughs> 
I would uh, I also like to uh, thank uh, Amy for giving me this uh, opportunity to talk today. And in fact, uh, uh, this is an informal talk, actually. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about my life in science and technology, which was full of uh, challenges. So that uh, you may be able to extract some useful hint from my talk, so that you should interrupt me anytime whenever you have a questions. Okay. So this is uh, my first challenge, actually. 1983, I was uh, uh, traveled tra from Tokyo to uh, Heathrow Airport in London through North Pole after stopping on college in Alaska, because just before boarding. Uh, Soviet jet airline shot down a uh, Korean Airlines flight near Hokkaido, the northern island. So we could not go through from Tokyo to Russia area. So that we diverted to this long way. So that's a tough uh, uh, travel because it took more than 20 hours with eight month old daughter with so it was terrible. So this was uh, uh, 1983. I was arrived at uh, MRC Labort. Oops. Laboratory Molecular Biology here. Before these three grew up, you can see clearly double helical ladders, not DNA. Okay. And this is the current uh, building they enjoy. So there, we discovered gene amplification of uh, muscle myosin heavy chain myo3 that compensate the deficit of another muscle myosin, uh, paramyosin gene, ANC15. So you can see these mutant alleles have two or three uh, copies of my myo3 genes here. And then these uh, vertical arrows suggesting the boundary of amplified fragments. So this is the first example of gene amplification in germline cells of multicellular organisms. Okay. So after this, I mean, that time Sidney Brenner stepped down as director of MRC LMB, and they set up a new unit, so-called molecular, molecular genetics unit in Edinburgh Hospital, which is here, and LMB here. So very close. And then that was only two percent, me and Sydney and me, so that I had purchased everything, including cherubs, benches, and machines before postdocs and student, graduate students arrived. There we uh, cloned and sequenced ANC13 genes, which is very important for uh, synaptic uh, transmission. So, but we use so-called chromosome walking. You don't know young people. Now, that's very untidy, laborious work, using a lots of radioisotopes. So you're lucky you don't need to do any more, because you, know, you can use uh, next generation sequencing to find this kind of mutations easily. And then uh, this is a more recent uh, uh, review. And then ANC-13 formed a so-called priming complex with uh, RAB3 and RIM. And then Calcium entering through channels. So calcium bound ANC13 induced a tremendous conformational change, and they interact with the snare complex to initiate uh, membrane fusions for exocytosis. So this is a. Then we uh, did very different uh, project to develop uh, bacteriophage surface di display. Okay. So that first we construct this uh, lambda phage vector by inserting amber stop codon just after uh, phage tail protein V here, stop codon, and followed by long stretch of linkers, including uh, endopepsidase recognition sequence, so that you can cleave after purify those, those pro foreign proteins and with, with uh, enzymes. 
So this was uh, again first example uh, of single molecular observation. We use that vector for the expression of E. coli beta graphitis. So you can clearly see tetrameric structure. So this is the uh, uh, I mean, first uh, single molecule observation in history. So I, I wonder, John Finch in MRC and did all negative staining and took image pictures for us. So I think John Finch must be the first person to observe single molecule. But I doubt it, because when I was uh, uh, excited looking at EM pictures, he asked me, did you expect this is a result? So I thought he thought, I mean, this is the, the wild type lambda phage vector with a bit of protein contamination. So may not be. <laughs> and then this is uh, uh, Hiroko, is my wife. Uh, we collaborate uh, uh, both in, in private life and in science. Okay. Okay, so the vector you can use, initially you should make a cDNA library, like this, a human seed, I mean, from cells or any organisms. And then you should coat micro titer plate or bees, agar bees or magnetic bees with a macromolecule, like proteins, lipid, sugars, DNA, RNAs. You can select those prones, interact with macromolecules. Then you can wash off all those unbound phage crones. And then you can elute with uh, uh, enzyme digestion to release the, the, the phage crone which interacts with those macromolecules. And then you can amplify those by infecting E. coli host, okay? And then you can repeat a few times to this. Then eventually you can clone whatever the crone if you're interested uh, by affinity uh, biopanning. Any questions? So far. OK, so this is uh, an example. We uh, cloned cDNA encoding uh, 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 autoantigen in Sjogren syndrome autoimmune disease by coating the pa patient serum on the surface of microtiter plate and applied human cDNA library to that. And then I purify those clones. And also, you can use by immobilizing sugar on the surface of, of uh, bees, agar bees, then you can clone sugar binding proteins. The, also, you can uh, coat uh, DNA on the surface of uh, magnetic bees, maybe. You can clone DNA binding uh, proteins, okay? Then we made a, a transatlantic uh, journey from UK to USA, San Diego in Southern California. This is a San Diego Bay. On top of this hill, there is a Scripps Research Institute. At that time, when, in 1990, when we moved there, they changed the institute name from Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation to the Scripps Research Institute. Now they changed again. So called, I mean, Scripps research, because they have a branch in Florida and that kind of thing. So, this Scripps research is surrounded by famous uh, Torrey Pines golf course. This is a 15th uh, signature hall in North Coast, I guess. And then, that time, they establishing graduate school as well as uh, founding a new department of cell, cell biology, where I was a uh, 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 founding member there. So that time, there at Scripps Research Institute, uh, late 80s or early 90s, the, many people are interested in uh, transmembrane signaling by cell surface receptors. And they propose so many different mo uh, models. For example, this is a dogmatic uh, ligand-induced dimerization model. That tells cell surface receptor uh, adopt a monomeric structure, exists a monomer. And then ligand binding, I mean, in this case, we show only transmembrane domains by de uh, removing this uh, extracellular domain, intracellular domain for clarity, okay? And then ligand binding to the extracellular domain induce the dimerization, where cytoplasmic domain brought together in 
close proximity, and then auto trans auto phosphorylate for downstream signaling. Okay? So it's a dogma. There's no model at that time. I will explain it. And then this uh, piston and scissors model for pro uh, proposed for bacterial aspartate receptor for TAR. TAR is involving bacterial chemotaxis by detecting uh, attractant uh, aspartate. So bring bacteria towards the higher concentration uh, uh, aspartate. And then this scissors model is proposed for erythropoietin receptor, which is essential for proliferation of erythroid progenitor cells. Yeah? Oops. So uh, when I was first year of graduate student, I had the chance to meet one other. And then when I asked what is most important for doing uh, excellent, fantastic uh, research, and then he mentioned just one word, intuition. So that intuition uh, keep my mind for throughout my uh, research life. And later I learned, Max Planck also said same thing. You know, the pioneer scientists must have a vivid intuitive imagination. And then also as a first year graduate student, I, I learned this, anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephant in terms of uh, size, okay? In terms of complexity, could be human. That is proved or, or, or supported by this recent genome uh, sequencing because we humans share 37% of genes with bacteria. Okay. So I started literature as such because my here my uh, uh, intuition came. You know, God or goddess had only six days to create everything, right? Including uh, cell surface receptors. <laughs> so so there, there must be some basic fundamental principle governing the uh, transmembrane signaling of all cell surface receptors. That's my intuition, okay? And then I searched the literature and I found many cell surface receptors may be activated by common mechanisms, particularly for these receptors in, uh, shown in red. For example, uh, varying to glutamate point mutation in transmembrane domain, which spontaneously activate all these EGFR, V2, FGFR, IGF, insulin receptor, PGF, activate. Only one mutation can activate all these receptors. The other evidence is uh, you can swap extracellular domain and intracellular domain of these receptors. And then, you know, it works. For example, if you make a uh, human EGF receptor extracellular domain, and the human insulin receptor is a cytoplasmic domain, that chimera is activated by only EGF, not insulin. And then EGF binding uh, phosphorylate cytoplasmic domain of insulin. And vice versa. And this chimeric receptor consisting of extracellular domain EGFR and intracellular domain of EPO, erythropoietin receptor. So EGF activate erythropoietin cytoplasmic domain and vice versa. The more interesting is Dan Kosheran, his uh, uh, seminar work demonstrates that if you make chimera with bacterial aspartate receptor extracellular domain, and human insulin receptor in, inside. The aspartate can induce phosphorylation of insulin receptor, right? So all these uh, uh, data or results suggest some common mechanism throughout these different dis distinct uh, receptors, okay? So this is also encouraging me. Look at this. Richard Feynman said, learn from science that you must doubt the expert. <laughs> okay? Science is a belief in the ignorance of the expert. And Sidney Bernard also the same similar thing. Science must be talented amateur, not expert. So if you think you are expert in the field or professional in the field, you should leave that field, okay? They said. 
So we first analyze a uh, bacterial uh, aspartate receptor, TAR, which has homodimeric uh, structure on the cell surface, and then physically interacting KA histidine kinase with the help of KW adapter. When repellent, nickel in this case, binds to the receptor, which activates KA to increase the uh, uh, phosphorylated key y through key A. That phosphorylated key y interacts with uh, Florida, uh, uh, flagella motor basement to induce a clockwise rotation. That break apart the uh, flagella bundle so that they stop there. They cannot swim and change the direction. In contrast, the aspartate attractant binding can inhibit key A uh, uh, phosphorylation, so that key, phospho KY no concentration down. Now, flagella loaded counterclockwise. That makes flagella stable bundle, so they can swim very long time. In this way, the bacteria can uh, avoid repellent nickel as a, a toxic uh, metal ions, and then they are attracted to nutrient like aspartate through so-called random, biased random work, okay? So the, the tar has homodynamic structure, I said. The monomer has two transmembrane domains, TM1 and TM2, TM1, TM2. And then TM1 is uh, just stabilized dimeric structure, so that they do not move during signaling, okay? So that we replace this uh, transmembrane, entire transmembrane domain with random peptide. And then searched, screened uh, genetically the functional artificial transmembrane domains. So this is a summary. The transmembrane domain surface consisting of three phases. Consisting of blue, yellow, and red. Blue surface consisting of small uh, hydrophilic amino acid. And then red is a huge hydrophobic amino acid. And the yellow region is somehow between these two in terms of hydrophobicity. So all those, uh, uh, and then we analyze the function of these uh, surfaces, these three ones, by inserting cysteine residues, by cross-linking of this surface to nearby TM1, which has another cysteine, okay? And then the result is consistent with the rotation model proposed here. When upon repellent binding, now uh, well, attractant may be better, is, is, is stabilize this structure, which is most stable structure because TM1 is somehow hydrophobic within the uh, hydrophobic uh, lipid bilayer, right? So that a has small uh, amino acid with hydrophilic residues, so that this is more stable in, within lipid binding. And then the parent binding form somehow transient will take this form with B area, this, this uh, surface facing towards TM1. So that's second stable structures. So transmembrane domain rotate about 20, uh, 50 degrees. Hmm? Okay, so next we move to human EGF receptors. So at that time, as you can see, these textbooks, there is a ligand-induced uh, dimerization dogma is, is around, and widely accepted, because in the textbook, where the, the uh, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase exists in, in a dimeric form, uh, monomeric form, as I explained, a ligand binding to the extracellular domain in these di uh, dimers, where cytoplasmic domain brought together in close pro proximity for trans autophosphorylation, which triggers downstream signaling. So this is a dogmatic model already. So we examine really EGFR is a monomer or dimer. So we express EGFR on the cell surface and then applied so-called membrane impermeable sulfur SMPB, which cross-link the receptor. If it's dimeric, it's cross-link, very efficient. 
Look at this. Almost 70% of total EGFR exists dimer. Uh, or 80, more than 80% of total uh, cell surface EGFR cross-linked 80%. And then the EGF uh, receptor family consisting of four members. EGFR or RB1, RB2, RB3, RB4. And then we use so-called bimolecular fluorescence complementation assay to see whether it's dimer or monomer, in which you can uh, fuse N-terminal or C-terminal half of the fluorescence protein, in this case YFP, yellow fluorescence protein, to receptor, EGFR. So if EGFR exists in the form of dimer, the fluorescence protein is uh, uh, reconstituted automatically to, fr to produce fluorescence, right? Look at this. Without, in, in the absence of ligand, all receptors produce fluorescence, indicating the receptor uh, dimer. In contrast, if you express full-length EGFR and EGFR lacking cytoplasmic domain, they do not produce any fluorescence, indicating cytoplasmic domain play a major role to form homodimeric structure, okay? And furthermore, if you add EGF, which is ligand for the EGF receptor, that cannot enhance any fluorescence, indicating 100% of EGF receptor dimeric. So this is a summary. So all those uh, four members of the EGFR family takes dimeric, homodimeric, one, one, two, two, three, three, and four, four. And all combination of heterodimer, one, two, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four, three, four. So they have, in the absence of a uh, ligand, have a, a homodimeric or heterodimeric structure. And RB3 homodimers and RB3 and RB4 heterodimers exist in the nucleus, mainly, or cytoplasmic as well. Because probably uh, RB3 has no kinase activity, so that they may have some function in nucleus. We don't know what they are doing. So then we try to understand how the uh, transmembrane domain of EGFR moves during signaling by constructing a uh, system replaced mutant. This is a linear structure of EGFR from N-terminus to uh, extracellular domain and cytoplasmic domain, and separated by transmembrane domain in cross-hatched region. And then we inserted nine consecutive alanine residues because uh, alanine has high propensity to form alpha helix, so that this region has expanded alpha helix structure of transmembrane domain towards the uh, uh, outside of cell. And then we replace these nine alanines with cysteine one by one to make this C1 to C9 cysteine replace EGFR mutant. So this is a summary of the result. In the absence of uh, a ligand, C2 has most efficiently formed uh, uh, cross-linking. And then toward the, the efficiency decreased toward C, C3, right? And then in the presence of ligand, obviously you have to uh, uh, prevent endocytosis to observe this cross-linking. Otherwise, the cross-linking receptor endocyte also degraded. You cannot see this. But if you, in the presence of uh, uh, endocytosis inhibitor, all the systems make very efficient the, uh, 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 system cross-linking. Particularly C7 in black is the most efficient to pro, uh, produce cross-linking. So that suggests upon ligand binding, transmembrane domain of EGF rotate about 40, 140 degrees from C2 to C7. Okay, so now all those results, I mean, we, quickly uh, go through, went through, but all those uh, uh, result, result is consistent with the, this rotation model or twist model, the transmembrane domain rotate. 
for both EGFR and ALTA. So, it should go back. About the completion of this EGF work, I heard from Sidney Brenner. He said, Japanese government planned to set up OIST in Okinawa. And then uh, he asked me the suitability of a uh, uh, founding president candidate. And then I said, no, not good. You should be uh, president. And then he accepted. So this is my largest contribution to OIST. <laughs> Oops. Then I, uh, so, so far, we used uh, three approaches to detect dimeric structure. Chemical cross-linking and, and bi-FC and system cross-linking. This is all unidirectional reactions. So that we, we don't know how much uh, EGF receptor exists as a dimer or monomer at steady state, right? So we searched again uh, uh, literature. And then I found FCCS, so-called fluorescence cross-correlation spectroscopy, maybe the choice to measure the ratio between uh, uh, ratio of monomers and dimers. And then I found Thorsten Warland, who is in Singapore. So I made a, another trans-Pacific uh, journey to Singapore. So again, this is uh, before uh, establishing this uh, biopolis. So we rented the space and started the work, and then waiting for completion of biopolis here. here. And then this is a, a slide made by a graduate student showing the principle of this uh, FCCS. Okay. So if the EGF receptor move as a monomer in this tiny 0.2 femtoliter confocal volume. You don't see any good cross correlation. Instead, if EGFR move as a dimer, you see very good cross correlation. So this is a, a summary of the data. After collecting many data, so saying mathematically calculate the percentage of dimer, okay? And using a monomeric GFP and monomeric MRFP in cytosolic as a negative control, they, they, as a, they monomers. And then we made a tripartite construct which uh, has uh, covalently fused MRFP, EGFR, GFP as a positive. They should move together, right? And then if you analyze this EGFR is for homodimer, RB2, RB2 homodimer, or RB2 EGFR homodimer, uh, heterodimer, they are significantly higher than this negative uh, uh, construct, uh, control. And then, I mean, statistically indistinguishable from uh, positive uh, control, suggesting that, that these homodimers and heterodimers uh, uh, behave as dimers. So after spending three years in Singapore, I completed the journey from Tokyo, Japan to Oise, I mean Okinawa, Japan. Okay. So this is uh, our founding members, Oise. Again, we rented, uh, worked on rented space on the other side of the island. And then after I leave, only Kenji is the mem founding member left. Yeah? Look like uh, very young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the original uh, design of uh, OIS campus entrance. So don't forget to request a uh, uh, cabinet office to build this bridge and elevators. Okay. <laughs> Okay, at OIST, uh, so we an made another challenge to dogma. So high impedance neurons with short processes, like uh, those of C. elegans, uh, the nematode C. elegans, people I mean, thought for the last four decades, 
They do not produce any uh, active uh, propagation. They send electronic signal by passive propagation. But in collaboration with Jeff, Jeff Wickens and his colleagues, we discovered the ACL and ACL, the major uh, gustatory sensor neuron, which produce oron and uh, depolarization. So that's, um, again, you know, don't believe any dogma. It's sometimes it's wrong. And also, we did a, a collaboration with Ulf Skogren and his colleagues to analyze a detergent solubilized dimeric EGF receptor. Okay? This is an, unlike the previously anticipated. People believing if you solubilize EGF receptor by detergent, they behave like uh, they are mono, monomeric. Okay? That's why they propose ligand induced dimerization model. But if you use DDM, I mean, uh, uh, kind of detergent. They cannot break dimers, so that you can purify dimeric EGF receptor. And then Ulf de determined this various conformers of EGF receptor. All right, this is a cryo ET uh, uh, good, good point. You know, it's very sensitive to determine various conformers. Okay? If you use single particle cryo e EM, you can determine very precise structures, but they are very stable structures, like a crystal structure. Okay, so they, they comp compensate each other. The cryo ET is not very uh, high resolution, but they can detect various different structures. So that, you know, combination of the two may be the best to, for the structural study. So this is a summary. In the absence of ligand, the EGF receptor dimer has very flexible extracellular domain and relatively stable intracellular domains. Right? Then in, in the presence of a ligand, now extracellular domain becomes relatively stable. And then intracellular domain is become flexible. So this is the model we propose for EGFR activation. So EGFR receptor exists, dimers, homodimers, through interaction of inter, uh, intracellular domain and transmembrane domains. In this uh, inactive uh, symmetric structure is, is a stable uh, uh, before activation, right? And then extracellular domain has kind, kind of these flexible structures. And then ligand bind to the uh, open antennas uh, molecules, which induce this kind of rotation by interacting with the other side of the protomers that as a rigid body. That likely to induce rotation of transmembrane domain, which dissociate the uh, symmetric kinase domains into asymmetric in, uh, active uh, kinase domains. So this is a, a model we propose. This is consistent with cryo EDM structure in every other uh, data. And then now many other people also analyzed other receptors, not only receptor tyrosine kinases, cytokine receptors, receptor granulocyte cyclase, receptor histidine kinase, and trans, uh, sensor transducer transmembrane protein, pattern recognition receptor, receptor tyrosine phosphate. Th th these are all uh, uh, exist as dimer, and they, the transmembrane domain is rotated upon ligand binding. And then th this uh, yellow uh, rotation angle is determined. So now, sum up or group all those receptors, you can say, the cell surface receptor adopt dimeric structure with flexible extracellular domain and stable intracellular domain, which induce this uh, stable uh, homodimeric or heterodimeric structure. Then upon ligand binding, induce rotation of transmembrane domain, which dissociate intracellular domain for downstream signaling. So, now, this is a relatively recent review. 
they mentioned ligand induced rotation in addition to still ligand induced dimerization. That's because Max Planck said, an important scientist, a scientific innovation really makes its way by gradually winning over and combating its opponent. Instead, what does happen is that the opponent gradually die out. <laughs> so we have to <laughs> wait for they die. <laughs> so this is a laboratory member who are brave enough to challenge dogmas. And these are institutions and agencies to support this project. And what's next is to rejoin my family in San Diego. This is a, a look at these two more far behind, okay? <laughs> and one more, my daughter taking this picture. So that's whole family in San Diego. So uh, last not, but not least, I would like to thank my wife, Hiroko, for her contribution. <laughs> well, obviously, without uh, which his, uh, I, mean, I, I could not be here today, okay? Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take questions. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much for an extremely impressive uh, and inspiring talk. I, I learned a lot. So there is a very interesting data showing like um, the 70% of EGFR dimerized without ligand in vitro, is that in vitro data. So three millimolar, is that the concentration? Is it really physiological? range or not? Well, that, that's a good question, though. Yeah, we, we changed all, all sorts of different con uh, concentrations and find best concentration to, to detect dimers. But I don't know whether it's, I mean, it's a, this is the in vitro experiment, right? And then uh, that kind of cross-linking efficiency is not very great, particularly if you do it, it on ice and kind of things. So. That's why uh, people didn't detect any dimers before we did. Mostly, they use different crosslinkers. So we find, uh, try to find many best, best crosslinkers to detect this. So that's difference. So, uh, you know, I believe it's not 70% or 80%. I, I think 100% is dimer because other data indicate. So it's, is that, is that answer your question? Well, I was wondering whether three millimolar is like a too high that will induce artificial oh, okay. dimerization okay. without you, ligand in, in the too, cell. If you use too high cross-link, concentrate too high, you don't see any uh, 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 receptor. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Look at this, it's all covered up, all the proteins, see, see. you don't see. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Matthias. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ichi, for this great uh, talk. Uh, in, in bacterial chemoreceptor arrays, the tar receptor exists in, in, in a sort of almost a crystalline hexagonal lattice, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. uh, is, is that consistent with the rotation? And is it, uh, is it, actually physiologically that the tar receptor exists individually? You know, the tar has a so-called hump domain in the inside uh, cytoplasmic domains. That has a co cogwheel structures. So that consistent with transmembrane domain rotations. The rotation induced rotation of a uh, cogwheel of uh, hump domains. That uh, induce uh, winding unwinding of uh, long alpha helical bundles in the cytoplasm tail. That uh, open up uh, methylation residues and, and rearrange those uh, uh, kinase domain uh, uh, well, place positions. So that, uh, I believe, is also the rotation is uh, consistent with this regulation of activity. More questions?
Are there only, ah, can you? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. So I have been uh, with you for a long time, but it was a very good opportunity to, for me to learn uh, how your research, uh, starting from the early days in uh, uh, UK, uh, carry on uh, until uh, the, your time in uh, OIST. And then uh, in uh, attacking a dog dogma, I think uh, you had uh, a lot of uh, difficulty. For example, uh, you used uh, like a fluorescent protein to monitor the state of a monomeric versus dimeric. But uh, uh, were there any like a criticism that uh, those attachment of the uh, fluorescent uh, component would affect the uh, monomerization, dimerization states? Yeah, well, I'm full of com um, critics. You know, I, I, I had. Yeah. And uh, if you modified whatever, mm -hmm. could happen so something I mean, funny or wrong or bad. So we, we did more than, I would say, 10 different approaches. Well, I omit everything. Oh, yeah. And then all those 10 different techniques converge to, to the 100% diamond. So that I, I believe, and then not only our, ourselves, but many others, you know, many other receptors also use it. I mean, take, took homodimeric structure, heterodimeric structure, and then rotate transmembrane the vein. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that kind of uh, data accumulating years and uh, over years. So I think, I believe the model is correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mean, still now, many people don't, I mean, believe in that ligand-induced dimerization model. Oh, really? yeah. I don't know how, you know, but, you know, that's psychologically, they don't want to accept the new models or, or what, you know. That's Max Planck, I mean, indicated. They have to die. <laughs> <laughs> and the four there, and the like uh, uh, TAR and the EGF and all those receptors, uh, this uh, uh, dimeric uh, rotation model uh, appears uh, very uh, uh, correct. But uh, are there other mechanisms of uh, transmembrane signaling mechanism used by other types of uh, receptors? Or this uh, rotation uh, is the uh, only or most common ways of uh, extracellular to Well, I, I wouldn't say every receptor behave like this. Oh. So maybe piston-like movement or scissors or, or what, what, maybe seesaws may, may be, but it's not be very beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if, if different receptor has different m mode, so, yeah. you know, maybe. There is some uh, exceptions, but I, I also think maybe your question is more general because there are other, other molecular constructs in the membranes we call receptors, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they behave a little bit different. Uh -huh. uh, well, but I would say for, in your field, acetylcholine receptor, oh, yeah. which are uh, multiple transmembrane domain mm -hmm. receptors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, those transmembrane domain rotate to open and close that, that channel. Because this is the most uh, uh, economical movement of the transmembrane domain in comparison to this translate you know, movement or, or up and down or, or this kind of, you know? So, so maybe this is uh, the case also for like a dopamine or serotonin receptors uh, as well? I, I, I guess so, I don't know. All right, thank you. Any more questions, or are we zooming in on the end here? Well, it was a very, very nice lecture for us. Thank and you. I would like to, all of us, give you a hand again. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. So next, so Ichiro, thank you again for the wonderful talk. And you earned your gift. So okay. Ulf is going to present oh. the gift. <laughs> <laughs>
addition, we have one more. Your unit members yeah. would like to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so honored that I have been the research unit administrator uh, for his unit, the Mariam unit, and this is from all the members of Mariam unit. Thank you very much. Thank you.